Officially, I would like to welcome everyone to our special um, presentation of the 100 years of Reiki. And for those who don't know, this year we are actually celebrating the first century of Reiki. So it, this is really a treat that we are receiving this evening. And I want to share with all of you that um, it is such a special moment because I have the honor to have in the room to my uh, first Reiki master, Ramon Cervantes, who is uh, from Belize and has been living in Mexico for so, so many years where I had the, the honor to, to, to meet him and to be his student. Ramon, si puedes saludarnos, if you can just wave. Uh, yeah, okay, so the guy in green is Ramon. And, um, and then I think uh, Rosy, my other Reiki master is also in the space, but she is with her camera off. Maybe later we can say hello to her as well. And I also want to acknowledge that um, we have um, two new uh, practitioners. Let me see how many, no, three, three new, they are uh, about to become Reiki practitioners. So we are gonna be offering uh, Reiki training, not this weekend, but the weekend after, and it's gonna be in Spanish. So we have uh, Melba, Thais, y Patty. Si pueden saludar a la cámara. So they are not initiated yet, but I thought it was gonna be a beautiful um, introduction for them to, to be in, in the space with us. So as you can see, we have all kinds of Reiki generations and my heart is just like glowing. Of course, to have all the uh, Semilla de Luz, um, practitioners and members and friends and family. Then we also have, along with Ramon, there is Jenny and they are connected from Bar Barbados. So thank you so much for making the effort to be with us. And I think there was Octavio in Mexico City. Yes, Octavio from Semilla de Luz, Mexico City. Octavio, si puedes saludarnos a la cámara. No sé si nos está escuchando, sí, sí, okay. Okay, so after all these beautiful introductions, um, without any further details, I would like to present uh, our speaker tonight. His name is Justin Stein, and there are so many things to say about him, but Justin is an instructor in Asian studies in the university in BC. And I, I believe that he is one of the historians who has the most uh, relevant and deep research and reliable research on Reiki. So it's really a privilege and an honor for all of us to have you here with us, Justin. Welcome and thank you so much for being in our space. Thank you, Laura. And uh, buenos noches a, to a todos. <laughs> Bonsoir a tout le monde. Uh, I'm going to speak in, in English because, uh, yeah, je parle un peu de français, mais pas, pas bien. And my, my, my Spanish is even worse. So, uh, so thank you uh, for uh, your generosity to listen to my English. I'll try to speak slowly. Um, I am from New York, so sometimes I get excited and I go a little fast. So if anybody wants to raise a hand or something during the presentation, if I'm going too fast, uh, you can tell me to slow down or, or ask me if you need me to repeat something. Um, also, um, I don't mind um, if you can turn on your mic and just say, oh, sorry, sorry, just one more time. What, what did you just say or something I can try to um, say again. Um, but actual for questions, if you could either, if there's a question during the talk, if you could maybe write it down and then we can do questions at the end, or maybe you could write it in the chat and we could do it at the end. I think that's easier because otherwise, 
I'll never finish the talk. I'll go, because <laughs> people start asking questions and I have a lot of response and then we'll just, it'll go on and on until it's, you know, midnight. So um, if you maybe, if you have a question, if you can wait till the end, I think that's more uh, helpful. And um, I was going to try to speak for about 45 minutes. Is that a good amount of yeah. time? Yeah, that is perfect because then afterwards we can have more time to uh, to ask some questions, and I will uh, keep track on the chat as well to in case there are questions that are coming in. And I thought Justin, maybe if you could spend a couple of minutes uh, by sharing a little bit uh, a question that I am sure you receive all the time, like how. How did you get into the universe of Reiki? Why Reiki? Sure. And then while I'm doing that, Laura, if you could also give me the sh screen sharing so I could do my slides. I Absolutely. I didn't ask you that before. Oh, Octavio, what's the problem? I have a fan. Is that, is, is the fan a problem? Octavio said there's a problem. Can, can everyone hear okay? Can people do like thumbs up? Yeah, okay. Octavio, ¿nos, ¿nos puedes escuchar aunque nosotros no te escuchamos? Yo creo que es en el audio de Octavio. Ok, so maybe you sí, can... Es... ¿Me escuchas? Sí, sí me ya. escuchas. Ya. Un, poquito, tú, un, poqu un poco de problemas con el sonido se interrumpe y vuelve a regresar. Nada más. Ok. Yo creo que tal vez es tu conexión. Esperemos que se, que se mejore. A veces cuando cierras tu cámara puede ayudar a sí. que la conexión sea mejor. Gracias, Octavio. Muy bien. Gracias. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe during, during the presentation, actually, if everyone turns off their camera, it sometimes that helps the, the connection. So maybe if we, we could turn the camera back on for the Q&A. And then, but for now, maybe you should everyone maybe turn their camera off for... The first part. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so yeah, a little about myself. Um, my first uh, exposure, I guess, to healing and energy um, actually was not from Reiki, but another healing practice um, that uses uh, chakra healing. Um, and that was a long time ago. That was what, 1998? maybe, but even before that, I was interested in meditation and yoga and all kinds of things. Um, but yeah, I think around 1998, I started doing this other healing practice, or 99, 99, uh, called Spiritual Human Yoga. Um, and I did that for a few years. Um, but then in 2001, I started uh, doing Reiki. I also learned uh, Joe Ray around that time. I was practicing Qigong. I was practicing a lot of uh, these things. And then um, I started studying it from a more academic perspective, um, really, I guess, in earnest around 2007. Um, and I did my master's program um, at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, um, looking at the history of Reiki. And then I continued my PhD program um, at the University of Toronto. So for about 10 years, I really was very dedicated to unpacking as much as I could about Reiki history. Um, I learned Japanese language. I interviewed uh, students of Hawaii Takata, um, students from Hawaii who were very old uh, Japanese Americans who were learning Reiki, um, some even in the 1930s and 1940s, um, and as well as her students that learned from her in the 1970s. And I wrote uh, my, my PhD uh, thesis on uh, Reiki's history and, and the role of Hawaii Takata, um, which will be a book uh, that's coming out next year. So um, I, I don't know if that's enough detail, but that's a little detail about myself. Um, I'm a second degree practitioner. I'm not a Reiki master. Um, I don't teach Reiki. Um, I also am a member of a Reiki organization in Japan called the Usui Reiki Ryoho Gakkai, which is the organization that uh, Usui Mikao founded in 1922, 100 years ago. So um, I've definitely been interested in exploring, um, on the one hand, the Japanese origins of Reiki, um, how Reiki is practiced 
you know, in different ways in Japan and different Japanese lineages, um, but also how Reiki changed as it came uh, to uh, Hawaii and then America um, and around the world and why it changed and how it changed. And that's a little bit of what I'll be talking about um, in my presentation. So yeah, here I can share my slide. And can everyone see that okay? Okay, that's okay. You can see okay. Yeah. Okay. I see a couple of people. Yeah. Talk. Yeah. We can see. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, thank you for the invitation to speak uh, to Sonia De Luz, uh, Reiki Mokbayal, and as I said, I'll try to keep this around forty-five minutes. Um, so that way we end um, around what eight p.m. your time, right? And then we'll have hopefully a whole hour or something for a question and answer discussion, because um, that's obviously very important. Okay, and so the, the title of the talk, I, I, I'm focusing on you know, this lineage, Usui, Hayashi, Takata, um, which for some of you, this is very familiar, you know this, maybe we have some Reiki masters here, you teach your students about the lineage. Uh, for some people, it sounds like you're brand new, uh, you're, you're about to go for Reiki training. So this may be very new uh, for some people as well. Um, but these practices that were taught by uh, Usui Mikao, Hayashi Chujiro, um, Hawaii Takada, uh, have changed a lot. And uh, today, this on the, on the right side here, I don't know how well you can see this image, um, but it's when you look up hashtag Reiki on Instagram, uh, the first thing that came up the other day when I took this image was something in Arabic language or Urdu, I'm not really sure. Um, things about crystals, things about astrology, right? And so some of this is very much, you know, the, the similar practices to what was being practiced 100 years ago. And some of what happens when people talk about Reiki today um, has actually very little to do, in a sense, with what was practiced 100 years ago. So um, in this talk, we're gonna look at this kind of hundred years of development, um, where Reiki has come from, where it's gone. And we'll um, also think about a little bit about what do different styles of Reiki have in common and what do uh, they have uh, that's different. So um, I'm just kind of broadly dividing this into two sections. Um, and in the first section, um, there's 50 years from Usui Sensei's founding of the first Reiki Dojo in Tokyo in 1922, um, to Hawaii Takada appearing in this book, We Are All Healers, in 1972. And this book, um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth because, um, but I've written about this and I'm happy to answer questions, but this book was what kind of made her a kind of celebrity in the healing world in the 1970s. Before this book, she had, I'd say a few hundred students, uh, mostly Japanese American. And after this book, she had thousands of students, people writing her letters. And so and I take this first 50 year period as a period where the practice of Reiki was systematized. Um, Hayashi, sorry, Usui, Hayashi, Takada, develop standardized modes of cultivating the self, of uh, treating others, and training students to practice Reiki. But then over the last 50 years, Reiki has undergone, I'd say, even more changes. And this is about kind of diversification, where there's new techniques, new ideas, new styles of Reiki, that have come out. And so uh, Reiki and chakras, for example, is something that started in the 1980s, really. Um, but there's also been a movement to go back to Japan to try to recover so-called traditional Japanese uh, Reiki practices before Takata made her changes. So I use these two books on the right to kind of show the, symbolize different movements that have happened in the last 50 years. And so today, um, first and probably the longest part of the talk is about the first 50 years of Reiki 
Then we'll talk about the last 50 years of Reiki. Um, then look a little bit at what Reiki styles have in common. And then what kinds of differences are there between different styles? And then obviously uh, I should put up there as well, question and answer discussion. Uh, I'm very interested to hear what you think. Okay. So again, for some people, this is review. For some people, maybe this is new. Um, but the first 50 years of Reiki, in a sense, are dominated um, by these teachers, um, that they and their lineage created the style of Reiki that would start to spread around the world um, in the 1970s and 1980s. And the founder, Usui Mikao, Japanese man, obviously, um, who he passed away, as you can see, in 1926, um, just, a, just four years, not even, less than four years after he started teaching um, this method. So he only had kind of a short time teaching, um, but several of his disciples followed in his path and continued teaching his methods, sometimes with maybe some small changes. And so we'll talk about um, one of his disciples, Hayashi, um, who taught um, also in Japan and was brought to Hawaii by his disciple, Hawaii Takata, um, who would really become the, the prime champion of Reiki for the middle decades of the 20th century. You can see she taught uh, for uh, 45 years. So um, her energy, her passion for Reiki or is really what made Reiki into a global practice today. And we'll be talking about each of them a little bit and the practices that they taught and how Reiki evolved over this period. So there's a lot I could say about uh, Usui Mikao. I'll try to keep it a little brief. Um, if anyone's interested in um, him or asking questions about his life, um, I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A. But basically, we know um, from the stone that is erected at his grave site in Tokyo that you see on the top there, um, it has a story of his life written and that he went through many different trials, uh, many difficulties. Uh, he had many different jobs. He had successes and he had failures. Um, he was very poor uh, for a period of time in his life but he was always studying and always learning. And he studied many, many different fields and he traveled outside of Japan to study. And at some point in his life, he went up onto this sacred mountain near Kyoto called Mount Kurama or Kurama Yama uh, for a three week period of meditation and fasting. And this is the Japanese text from the memorial stone. And it says that he climbed Kuramayama. He did 21 days of what it says is kind of like um, severe austerities, fasting, meditation, um, very hard um, kind of personal cultivation, self-cultivation practices. And after 21 days, it says he felt a large Reiki. He felt this, this powerful, what you might say, energy um, over his head. And suddenly he had what they call Reiki Yoho, the Reiki healing method or Reiki therapy. Um, this story is similar to other stories of kind of holy men in Japan. Um, we could talk more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, but the important thing is that the stone says, and we know from oral tradition as well, that he came down the mountain with this healing method and he knew how to pass it on to other people. There had been many people who were able to heal, but that Usui Sensei was able to pass it on to other people. And the way that he passed it on to other people was through a ceremony that they called Reiju. And Reiju, what we call today initiation, um, was practiced 
at meetings at the dojo. And during these meetings, the student sits receiving the ceremony from their teacher. And in a sense, the student is like Usui himself, who went up to the mountain and received the practice from the universe, from the cosmos. So Usui on, on Kurama, meditating, fasting, praying, received the practice, but his students and their students don't have to go on the mountain. They don't have to do this difficult practice. They receive it from their teacher. And again, we can talk about this more in the Q&A if you're interested, but the actual uh, system of the initiation or of the Reju ceremony um, resembles very closely initiations from Japanese Buddhism, a particular kind of Japanese Buddhism called Mikyo or esoteric Buddhism. Um, so it seems that Usui Sensei had studied maybe these other methods and incorporated them into his own method of how to pass the practice on. Another practice that he, he and his students engaged in uh, to cultivate themselves it says to cultivate a pure heart mind, um, a pure kokoro, um, is this practice of recitation. So on Usui Sensei's memorial, and also in other texts um, that are attributed to him, and in uh, descriptions written by his students, uh, they talk about sitting quietly with their hands in gasho, in prayer position like this meditating on and chanting certain texts. Um, one of these texts is called the Five Precepts or the Gokai. Um, another text that they used is the poetry of the Meiji Emperor. And I'll talk about that a little later. But the first, the, the most important, I think really, is the Five Precepts. And so this is the Five Precepts written in Japanese, my translation. Um, that it's a method to invite happiness. It's a, what they call a wonder drug or a miracle medicine of all disease, right? It can cure anything. And what is this wonder drug? What is this secret method? Kyo dake wa, for today only. Do not anger, do not worry, be grateful, fulfill your duty, do, do what you have to do in this life. Um, and be kind to people, right? Those are the five. Do not anger, do not worry, be grateful, do your duty, be kind to people. And it says every morning, every evening, put your hands in gasho, keep these words in your heart and say them with your mouth. Okay. We'll talk about this more in the Q&A if you're interested, um, but this seems to be a very core practice. Um, and this practice, it said, cultivates a pure heart, a pure mind, and make someone a better practitioner. Um, they also had a book of these poems by the Meiji Emperor. Um, these poems were also seen to cultivate a pure heart mind. And I've, I've done some more research about that recently. I'm happy to talk more about that if people have questions about that. Um, in terms of how exactly Reiki treatment was practiced, we don't have a lot of detailed information. Um, it does seem that in Japan in the 1920s and 1930s, Reiki was mostly practiced with one hand. Today, we mostly practice with two hands, but it seems in the beginning, there was a lot of people did one hand treatment. Um, there was an emphasis on being able to diagnose um, by feeling vibrations in the hand. Today, often Reiki practitioners are told not to do a diagnosis. It could get you in trouble maybe with the law that to do a diagnosis, you have to have a medical license. And so, you know, Reiki practitioners don't have medical license. So a lot of times we're told don't diagnose anybody, but it seems that this was an important aspect was to feel with your hand where there are certain vibrations in the patient and this would have you treat a particular place for their um, problems. 
And although there was also a book where they had um, specific hand positions for different diseases. Um, and I'll, I'll show an example of that in a little bit. Um, they talk about key and light coming out of not only the hand, but also from the eyes that you can shoot Reiki out of your eyes, that Reiki is in your breath. And so there was treatment with the breath um, as well. Um, and we also know that there was distance treatment um, and that at this time they often used photographs. So they would have a photograph of the person and that they would treat the photograph and that would be the way of treating someone who is not nearby. And I should mention for people who are new to Reiki, um, this distance treatment is not taught at the beginning level, but at the more advanced level, um, which we have here. Um, so today um, we talk about Reiki one, Reiki two, and then third degree, master degree. Um, in the original teaching system, there were more levels. Um, the first, what we call first degree, um, students advanced more slowly in the original. That their, their teacher would monitor their progression maybe over the course of several months, um, that they are learning, that they are improving before saying, okay, you have mastered Shoden. So there were different levels as you went through what we would consider to be first degree. Um, then what we call second degree also was taught in two parts. So the three symbols in second degree um, were taught two symbols at first. You learn those, you master those, and then you learn the distance treatment in Okuden Koki. Finally, becoming a, um, a teacher, a master also, was taught in parts um, where maybe first you learned how to do Reiju and you could maybe teach beginner level students, but you didn't necessarily have um, authorization to um, teach the full uh, practice. So uh, just a little bit about Usui's um, teaching system. Uh, so, I'm not going to get so into this today. If you're interested in this more, um, I don't necessarily have time to go into all of this, but if, if but there are different influences on Usui's early practice. Um, there were other healing methods um, at the time. Uh, there's aspects of esoteric Buddhism, aspect of mountain religion, aspects of emperor worship, and aspects of other traditional arts um, in Japan, including martial arts. Okay, so that's the end of kind of the Usui section. Um, yeah, just in, in, in uh, summary, he had a lot of influences. Um, the students slowly progressed over a long period with their teacher monitoring their process. Um, and that he died, you know, not long after the practice. And he may have made changes to systematize the practice uh, more if he had lived a bit longer. Um, one of his students would systematize the practice more, um, would um, add some medical elements. Um, some people um, have said um, that, Usui, that Hayashi Sensei, um, one of uh, Usui's uh, top students was a medical doctor. And it makes sense because there are aspects of um, medicine as we'll see um, in some of what he taught. Um, some people also said maybe he had training in Chinese medicine, because some of the hand positions that are in his book um, are very closely related to some uh, aspects of maybe what's sometimes called oriental medicine or Chinese medicine. Um, but yeah, he uh, was the top level in the Usui Reiki Ryoho Gakkai, and he established his own uh, organization, the Hayashi Reiki Kenkyu Kai. And in uh, Hayashi's uh, method in Hayashi's teachings. Um, we know that there was the intuitive diagnosis where students use their hand to find the vibration um, using their intuition, using their sensitivity to energy. Um, but there were also elements of medical uh, diagnosis as well. And so one of Hayashi's students um, is this figure, Matsui Shou. And there's an article about a patient who received treatment from Matsui 
and Matsui's wife and one other practitioner. They work together, the three practitioners working together to treat the patient. And in the diagnosis, um, first they interviewed him about his um, problems. Then he took off his clothes, which is something we don't do anymore, right? In, in Reiki practice, we, we treat people fully clothed, generally, I think. Um, and so he took off his clothes, he laid down on a table and they checked, this is interesting, they checked his blood pressure and they checked it, they listened to his heart um, as part of the intake process, right? This is also something, not something that we do um, usually in Reiki practice. And so there's definitely, it sounds a bit like you're going to the doctor, right? You're, you're getting undressed, you're lying down, they're listening to your heart, they're checking your blood pressure. Um, and then the practitioners felt for the vibrations in the body as well. And that through the interview, the um, kind of more medical diagnosis, and then the more energetic diagnosis, the practitioners decided how to treat the, the patient. They, they determined where the, the root cause of the illness was, and then they treated that spot. Um, or those spots. So again, maybe um, high, under Hayashi, um, some small changes. Um, so other changes in the Hayashi uh, treatment guide, uh, which um, by the way, I can give a link in the Q&A, was recently uh, retranslated into English, Spanish, French, and other languages, and is available for free online. So if anybody wants the link for the Hayashi uh, treatment guide, I can provide that um, in the chat a little later. Um, but we see here changes from the, from the Usui treatment guide. Um, and some of the changes involve more specific um, anatomical descriptions, different organs in the body um, that kind of requires some uh, knowledge of the body and of anatomy. And so it seems, and I have other evidence as well, it seems that Hayashi taught his students some anatomy um, in addition. Um, finally, one other major change that Hayashi made that would affect the development of Reiki for a long time, for until today, is that he offered courses that helped his students accelerate their progress to second degree finishing first degree in four days, and sometimes even taking second degree on the fifth day. So in one week, a student could go from nothing to second degree all in one week, in five days. Um, this seems to be a real change. Um, Usui and his students did teach sometimes five-day workshops, but from my research, it seems that to get to second degree, someone would have to practice for probably about a year before they would allow a student to progress to second degree. Um, Hayashi seems to have sped up this process a lot. Um, I don't have exact uh, knowledge of this. I've, I've done a lot of research about this and I could talk about this in more detail if people are interested, but it seems that he taught a five-day course where there were initiations or reju every day. The first four days would be first degree and the fifth day would be second degree. Um, eventually, these classes were split up and second degree, usually students would have to wait um, for a period between first degree and second degree, practice first degree um, before the teacher would agree to teach them second degree. I don't know when exactly that happened. It could be that Hayashi decided that he didn't like doing this anymore and he changed it before he died, or it could be that Hawaii Takata changed it herself. I'm not really sure, uh, to be honest. Um, sorry, I just wanna close one thing for a sec. Okay, great. Um, so um, again, there's still things I don't know about the history. I've been working on this for many years and I still have questions. Um, at some point, the Meiji emperor poetry was discontinued. I don't know when, I don't know if Hayashi did that. I don't know if Takata did that. It's possible 
that he stopped the recitation of the emperor's poetry. Um, but some things that we do know is that he had patients lie down on mattresses in a kind of clinic, which seems to be new, um, that he had hand positions that, that went work with organs and medical diagnoses, um, that he had a training course where you got initiations every day. And at the end of the course, you got a certificate. Um, these seem to be things that Hayashi um, introduced uh, into the practice. Okay, I hope, I, I hope this isn't too much. We're about halfway through our time. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about Hawaii Takata, and then we're gonna move to the more recent practices. Um, but I know for some people, this is maybe a lot of review. For some people, I know this is very new. So I hope everyone is doing okay out there. <laughs> We're about halfway through my talk. So I hope, I hope this is interesting for you. Um, Hawaii Takata um, briefly was born uh, on a sugar plantation. Her family were laborers working in the fields. Um, she grew up very quickly. She left school at age 12 to begin work. She married at age 16. Um, her husband, you know, tragically died very young. He was 35. She was only 29 when he died. Um, and so she became a widow. And after she became a widow, um, she was working very hard and she became ill. And she traveled to Japan for medical treatment. And she ended up getting um, treatment at the Hayashi Reiki Kenkyukai. She ended up getting Usui Reiki Ryoho treatment and fully recovered. And because of this, dedicated herself to learning this method under Hayashi, and then um, invited Hayashi to come to Hawaii with her, where he taught. And during this apprenticeship, she became a full, what we would call today a Reiki master, a full Shihan, they would say at the time. Um, and here's a photo from that teaching trip. Um, maybe some of you have seen this before. In the center is Hawaii Takata doing a Reiki demonstration. Um, seated there is uh, Chujido Hayashi. And here hanging, uh, we see the scroll with the five precepts. Um, this is written by Hayashi in his calligraphy. And um, it, it shows that at this time, uh, the Japanese language precepts were still being taught. Uh, most of their students were Japanese in Hawaii. Um, there are a couple of exceptions, but um, before World War II, almost all of the students um, of Usui Reiki Ryoho were Japanese or Japanese American. Um, however, particularly after World War II, even a little bit before, but particularly after World War II, Hawaii Takata began teaching more and more people who were not of Japanese background, more and more um, white American students. And she made changes to the practice, I would say for three different reasons. One thing is there were aspects of the practice that I think she felt that her mostly white Christian students didn't really understand because they weren't Japanese, they weren't brought up in Japanese background. And so she added and took out things from the practice that she felt like her students may not understand or added things to help them understand certain things that she thought was important about the practice. She also changed things about the practice to make it more of a professional practice. Um, people before, like, I think really before the 1970s were not professional Reiki practitioners. People did it, I think, out of their devotion to help others. Um, sometimes their patients out of gratitude would give something back. Um, at, the, at the clinics in Japan, there were some fees, um, but, and actually in, in Takata's own clinic, there were fees, but it, was, it seemed like it was pretty rare for someone to be a professional Reiki practitioner before Hawaii Takata. And she's the one who made it so you could go into business as a Reiki therapist, as a Reiki practitioner. And she had trained in massage. And so I think some of the training that, some of the changes that she made 
were to try to standardize Reiki practice to make it more professional. The third reason I think she made some changes is that she practiced Reiki for a long time. And I think she found there were certain things that made the practice um, easier, that maybe made it more um, effective in her mind. Um, for example, treating with two hands. That's how she mostly taught, is treating with two hands. I think she learned treating with one hand, mostly. But this is something where I think that she found this was more effective and made these changes. And again, these, I'm saying these are three different reasons why she made some changes. There were some changes that I think you know, overlap. It's not one, two, three, as much as these are different aspects of her experience um, and her teaching experience that I think are, are underlie some of the changes that she made. One of the big changes is what we call the foundation treatment. So um, I don't know exactly how uh, it practice you know, in, in uh, Simia de Luz, but in, in most, I would say, Reiki lineages, most Reiki practice around the world today, um, people tend to treat in a systematic way, maybe 12 hand positions, 15 hand positions, something like that, five minutes per position, it creates a, a treatment of about an hour or 75 minutes. This seems to be something Takata started maybe around the 1940s, um, or like sometime maybe after World War II. Um, her early students who I spoke to did not know about this. Um, they, like I said before, would feel the vibrations with their hand to know where to treat. Um, but Takata said, um, so, you know, she said that the, um, the body is a whole system, right? She had this very idea of like holism. And so you want to treat the whole body when you can, is what she said. She also told her students to listen to their hands. Um, I said 1940s and here it says 1960s. Um, the 1940s, she had the idea of treating the whole body. Um, in the 1960s, 1970s, she had the thing about five minutes per position. So that's why there's a little difference there. Um, but the idea of five minutes per position, one hour treatment um, is something she developed over time. And again, uh, there may be influence here from her training in massage. You want a one hour treatment. You can charge a set fee for one hour. Um, this idea of holism and also maybe her own experience. She found maybe the, you know, okay, the vibration seems strong on the liver, treat the liver, and then she would treat the liver well, and now there's a problem somewhere else in the body, in the kidneys or the lungs or the throat. So she found, I think, that by treating the whole body, she got better results. So this is how she taught, is to treat the whole body. But she also told her students, listen to your hands. So don't be necessarily strict, only these positions, only five minutes, right? If your hands are telling you something different, listen to your hands was another major teaching of hers. Um, as I mentioned, two hands. She made some changes to the, the five precepts. Um, these may be more similar to the precepts you learned than the ones I mentioned earlier. Um, you can see, still has just for today, do not worry, just for today, do not anger. Although she changed the order for some reason, I don't know why. Um, but number three is new. Honor your parents, teachers, and elders. So respect authority, right? Respect your teacher, respect your elders. This is something that is a very common uh, value in Japanese society. This is something that's a, a basic idea in Japanese um, culture. And I think that she introduced this because she had these students especially in the 1960s and 1970s, students who were hippies, right? students who did not respect their authority, students who asked too many questions, students who wanted to change the system. And so she, I think, put this in to say, hey, listen to your teachers, listen to your elders, respect authority, in a sense, to make her students more like Japanese people. That a lot of times, Hawaii Takata is criticized for making Reiki too Western, 
but I think she actually tried to make it very Japanese in a way for her students who didn't understand um, Japanese culture. So that's one example. Um, one other example, and I'm not gonna go on too long about this. Um, if people have questions in the q and I'm happy to talk about this more, but she gave this idea that you can't give Reiki away for free. That if you give stuff away for free, people don't value it. And there needs to be a kind of exchange of energy. And I also think that in Japanese culture, the idea of reciprocity, of you, you receive something, you give something, right? That that's just a, a, a natural idea in Japan. You come to someone's house for dinner, you bring them something, right? You go see your, you visit your friend, you bring them something. They give you something to take home, right? This idea of exchange is a very natural part in a sense of Japanese culture. And I think that Hawaii Takata tried to instill this ethic into her students. Okay, so that's, that's all I have about Hawaii Takata. Um, we have about 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, I'm not gonna talk as much about the differentiation of Reiki, um, but after Hawaii Takata's passing in the 1980s and 1990s, um, more kinds of Reiki, different Reiki styles appear. Um, the first big division was the succession um, uh, from Hawaii Takata, who would be her successor. And we saw um, in the 1980s, Phyllis Furumoto on the left and Barbara Weber Ray um, to her, to just to her right, that there was a, a you know, disagreement between them and between their students about who was the legitimate successor. Um, the next figure, William Lee Rand, um, he introduced many uh, new aspects of Reiki. He learned some from different teachers, but new symbols, um, new styles of Reiki, Karuna Reiki, Holy Fire Reiki, Tibetan Reiki is another figure, Arthur Robertson, who I don't have up here, but the Tibetan Reiki styles, um, Angelic Reiki, you see on the bottom there, the chakras you see on the bottom there. These are things that started after Hawaii Takata, the 1980s. People brought in new ideas, new forms. Sometimes they said, this is the true original form of Reiki. You know, this was a secret. Maybe Usui Sensei himself didn't know this practice, but you know, thousands of years ago in Tibet or Atlantis or Lemuria or Egypt, you know, people practice Reiki like this. And this is the true form of Reiki. So that, there's that whole kind of side of things. Then there's also this um, movement um, on the right here, we see some of the main figures in the Jikiden movement. Um, the, the older woman sitting on the right there, Yamaguchi Chiyoko, um, was a student of Hayashi Chujiro. And uh, Ch uh, Chiyoko Sensei started teaching in the 1990s what she had learned from Hayashi Sensei. Um, and it became known as the practice of Jikiden Reiki. And sitting uh, next to her there is Frank Arjava Petter, who's written many books um, and is today one of the, the prime uh, teachers of Jikiden Reiki. Um, so different, very different uh, practices uh, coming out in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit here. Um, yeah, I mentioned some of this. Okay, here's Arthur Robertson who did the Tibetan Reiki. Um, and yeah, that there's different lineages now that are saying, that they are like the traditional Japanese Reiki um, that, that revive these practices that were like lost in translation. So today there are all these different types of Reiki out there. Um, some of them are, are called Western Reiki. Some of them are called, you know, Japanese Reiki. Um, I like to, in my work, argue that the differences between them are sometimes overstated, um, that, aspects of what we call a quote unquote Western Reiki, as I've said, were attempts to actually put Japanese culture into Western people and teach them certain uh, teachings and ethics and values uh, that are part of Japanese culture. Um, I also have a question, you know, 
how much did the so-called like Japanese lineages themselves change over time? Or maybe changing is not a bad thing, right? Maybe from the 1920s, people recited the poetry of the emperor. Maybe we don't need to recite the poetry of the Japanese emperor, you know, from that time. So, you know, there's a lot of questions, but there's a lot of different Reiki styles out there. And again, I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has questions about any particular um, style. But what I'd like to finish with is thinking a bit about what is common to all types of Reiki and what are the points where people um, differ and, and have their, their differences. So I, I've thought about this a lot. I've, I've come up with these five points that all forms of Reiki that I, that I consider. I mean, if someone has thinks something different, please let me know. Um, but this is what I think about, you know, when I think of Reiki, I think about these five things, basically. Um, one it has to do with healing. The healing, not just of the body, but healing of the mind, healing on a spiritual level um, as well. And that healing, um, part of it, right, is, is done at least, part of it is done through hands. Um, sometimes, some lineages, breath. Um, often using visualization, um, particularly at the higher levels, um, the symbols and distance treatment, right? Um, that there is this kind of holistic healing through hands, breath, visualization. That's my number one. Number two, that actually Reiki is a natural ability that living things can do, but that this ability is awakened and strengthened um, by receiving initiation or empowerment from a master. And it's deepened through practice that, that Reiki in general um, stresses, not that you're like, will lose the ability to do Reiki if you stop practicing, but that if you practice regularly, it deepens your ability and it, and it makes it um, more, come more naturally maybe to you. Uh, three, this idea of lineage, the lineage going back to Usui Sensei. Uh, four, that Reiki is taught at different levels. And at the higher levels, students learn symbols and the symbols allow people to do different things, including distance treatment. Um, and five, that there's this idea of the Reiki precepts or Reiki ideals. Um, I think this is common to basically every form of Reiki and that the precepts or ideals help people develop morally, spiritually. Um, I, I have about five minutes left. I see there's a, a, something in the chat. I'll take a look at that in a, in a little bit. Let me just wrap up um, with some things that are different from different between different um, styles. So some styles really do focus on meditation and recitation. Um, I mentioned the recitation of the five precepts, the recitation of the Meiji Emperor's poetry, um, there's also, sometimes that is taught as part of uh, a bigger practice called Hatsudeho. Hatsudeho um, is the method of emitting day or deiki, um, which involves meditation, um, sometimes kneeling in prayer position, um, different types of visualization and breathing methods. Some styles have this, some styles don't. Um, how training is done. Uh, whether someone uh, style does reju regularly, um, some styles every time students come together under their master, the master gives them reju. Other styles, you get initiation one time, and that's it. That's all you need. Um, in uh, some Takata lineages, there's what they call reiki blessing, which is similar to reju, where the teacher can give. It's not exactly another initiation, but something similar that kind of reawakens the, the Reiki in them. It connects them to the source of Reiki. Um, and it, it's, a, it's maybe similar to Reiju in some Takata lineages as well. Um, the, uh, the question of how quickly do you teach your students? Um, you know, sometimes there are weekend workshops where students go from nothing to a Reiki master in one weekend, right? Other lineages uh, stress that it takes many years, um, apprenticeship programs, right? So this is something that different styles uh, do differently. 
Um, another thing that's a, that's a difference is how do you touch the body? Do you touch the body? Um, many people today touch practice Reiki without the hands on the body. They have the hands a little bit off the body. Um, early practices seem to have had massage techniques. Um, some of those techniques may have been taken out because of legal reasons, that if you don't have a massage license, it might be illegal to press into the body, um, depending where you live. So these things change over time, different uh, lineages, different styles uh, teach that differently. The question about hand positions, what are your hand positions? Do you um, use the vibration method, sometimes called Byokan or Byosen, to feel the disease in the patient's body, a scanning technique? Um, do you use the hand positions you know, religiously, you know, only these positions, five minutes per position, or do you go more based on intuition and feeling? Um, this is a, a, something that changes style to style. Um, some people believe that it doesn't matter where your hands are because the Reiki energy will go, sorry, there's a fire truck or something, um, but that the Reiki energy will go where it's needed. Um, other people disagree. So that's a, another difference. Um, another difference is about symbols and the vocalizations used with those symbols. Um, some lineages only have three symbols in the second degree. Um, some teach the master symbol in the fourth degree. Others have other symbols as well. Um, some disagree about what you say when you use the symbol. Um, so this is another difference uh, between some styles. Um, and I think this is my last uh, couple more. Um, anyway, I know it's a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm almost, we're almost at the Q&A though. So uh, just hang on for just a few more slides. Um, and I hope this is, again, I hope this is interesting. Um, some systems talk really about organs, some talk about chakras, uh, some talk about these different three centers of energy in the body, uh, sometimes called the three diamonds. So this is a difference. Um, some people disagree about, you know, when you're doing Reiki, should you set an intention or should you, you know, uh, detach yourself from any outcome? Should you say a little prayer? Um, you know, for the highest good of the patient um, and connect to your higher self and ask for the best thing for their higher self. Um, or again, you know, others say, um, as Japanese phrase, munen musou, you know, don't think of anything. Just, you know, try to clear your mind and allow the Reiki to work through you. Um, some say, for example, when you're doing a mental emotional treatment, um, that you can't use a negative statement. Um, you know, instead of saying, you know, I, I want to, this person wants to stop drinking alcohol so much, you know, you should say, this person wants a, a healthier lifestyle or something. So different disagreements between different lineages about how the power of intention, the power of prayer, um, whether you should connect to God, you know, a Buddha, the higher self, a spirit guide, angels, right? This is something that's different uh, from one uh, style sometimes to another. Um, and finally, the last uh, thing that's different, um, we know that early in Reiki history, they did not advertise Reiki, that they were, there was this kind of prohibition. This is a quote from a, um, an article, a Japanese language article um, about Matsui Sho, who I mentioned before, um, where he says, you know, that Usui did not like advertising Reiki. And we know, right, obviously today, Facebook, um, you go to the health food store, you know, there's a whole bulletin board of people advertising their Reiki practice. This is something that changed over time. Um, and some uh, lineages take this more seriously, that it should just be word of mouth. Um, some people are okay, um, you know, putting up a billboard or signs or flyers, what have you. So. Um, this question as well is another thing where people disagree. Okay, came pretty close to 45 minutes, maybe more like 50 minutes. But in conclusion, Reiki has changed, right? Uh, over time, Reiki became more systematic. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. 
right? That there are changes that I think happened to make it so non-Japanese people can learn this practice that started in Japan and treat it maybe with a kind of respect uh, that maybe the earlier students uh, had for their teachers, uh, for the practice. Um, so yeah, maybe some changes uh, can be a good thing. Um, on the other hand, right, there are certainly other changes um, that you may disagree with. And so I think there's this question of you know what Reiki style feels you know true uh, for the individual, um, and this is another aspect that changed over time is how systematically to teach. Um, certainly, if you're teaching large classes, you have a lot of students. It's very helpful to have a system. Um, on the other hand, um, there are also benefits to a more individualized training uh, practice which it seems to be how it was done uh, more in the, in, the early, um, in the early period. Um, and the Usui Reiki Ryoho Gakkai today in Japan, um, I think they still really do have a very individualized um, approach, but at the same time, they're a very, very small school and they've had difficulty attracting and retaining students and training new generations of teachers. And so having a systematic approach also has a lot of benefits, right? Where it's a lot easier to teach. Um, you, it's a lot easier to have a lot of students. Um, and maybe some of those students um, over time will have their own individualized experiences with Reiki and that will help them deepen their practice in a different way, right? That, um, but maybe more their own experiences. But it seems that in your community, maybe there's a balance of these things where there's training, but there's also an ongoing community for feedback and things like that. So anyway, that's, that's the end um, of my, my talk. Um, I really appreciate your attention, um, your time, your interest, and I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, I can share this in the chat as well, my email, my website, and also the website I mentioned um, with the, um, with the uh, gray book and the, um, the translations of Hayashi manual. So anyway, thanks so much. Wow. Thank you so much, Justin. I think we are like with our eyes this big, <laughs> amazed of all the information. And I think we, you have, you have material to go like for a week at least. Yeah. <laughs> I'm stop talking. Thank you so much. I do have many questions, but uh, I'm gonna um, read first the ones in the chat, and um, also. Uh, Benjamin is asking you if you can actually put the link for the Hayashi therapy guideline. Yeah, I'm doing that now. Yeah. And I want to let everyone know that I do have a copy of the gray book that was uh, original by Hawaii Takata. And this is the, the, the latest, latest edition. So if anyone is interested in taking a look, I will gladly uh, lend this to you. So um, Christina is asking us if you know which hand was used at the time where it was supposed to be only one hand practice. Yeah, so um, thank you for the question. And um, I believe like what I've seen usually is that you use, you use your dominant hand mostly. So if you're right-handed, you use your right hand. If you're left-handed, you use your left hand. But then as your hand gets tired, it's okay to change. Right, if, you, if you're doing a long treatment and you have your hand here for you know, 20, 30 minutes, something, and, and it's tired, it's okay to use your other hand for a little bit while you get blood back in this one. Um, but yeah, in general, I think you-, you Yeah, I'm just curious because like my, my body, my energy, apparently my prana, it, it goes towards the left. I'm actually right-handed, uh -huh. but, but it's just, I, I have like structural problems and apparently my, my prana tends to like- Interesting. Work to the left. So m my Reiki on my left hand is much stronger. Wow. These are things that I have to work on. So I was just really curious on also this idea, 
in the Western mystery tradition, or I've heard it through the most Western mystery tradition, that you know that the right gives and the left receives. Yeah. So I was just really curious about if they actually had just one hand for it, or, yeah. or, or how they how they did that. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily like right or left, but there is also right. The I don't know if you have it in your group, but the Reiki circle practice with the the giving. So you you have your hands, you know, like this oh, yeah. and. And it goes, and so I've seen it different ideas, but that yeah, I think in general it's the left receives and the right gives is what I understand in the Japanese uh, reiki mawashi, um, the circle. So left hand up to receive from the person next to you, right hand down to to transmit out um, is the way I think it's generally practiced. Although I know some people in some groups they do it like that first for a few minutes and then they switch. So. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, then we have Octavio who is asking, uh, what is your experience yeah. to feel Reiki and Qigong? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm just one person and I know there's uh, many other people out there maybe who have more experience than me. Um, so I could talk about my personal experience and I can talk about the history and you know what I know about historical materials. Um, so my personal experience, um, I think qigong or ki, in Japanese kiko, very powerful. Um, you you know you practice for five or ten minutes even, and your hands and you really feel it in your hands. I mean, um, and I think it's a wonderful practice. I wish I practiced it more. I used to practice it like every day for a while, and now. I don't, but I should. I, I, I really love uh, Qigong. Um, and, you know, the, the party line, you know, the, the, what, what everyone says about Reiki and how it's different from Qigong is that Qigong is your personal qi or your personal qi and Reiki is not your personal qi, right? That Reiki comes through you from the cosmos um, a lot of times it's thought about coming down through your crown, right? And um, out through your hands and you are just a channel, right? That it's not your energy at all. Um, I, I think that there are, uh, there is evidence that in early Reiki teachings, um, the, the hara, the, the lower abdomen, um, or what someone's called the, the lower tanden, um, which is the energy center. Um, they someone say, you know, two or three fingers. If you put your, your someone has two fingers, someone has three fingers below your belly button, right? The bottom of your abdomen and then in, right? So like two fingers in, two fingers down and two fingers in, right? So somewhere kind of in your lower abdomen between maybe your belly button and your like genital anal area. Um, that, that, that right there, right, it's maybe your most important energy center in the body. And that when you're doing Reiki, Takata at times talked about there's a battery there. And that when you um, are practicing Reiki on yourself, um, when you're practicing Reiki on others, that actually what's happening is you get the charge from the universe, it comes through your antenna, and that recharges your battery. And then, and then when you practice Reiki, it comes out from your battery and into the patient. And so, you know, is it going directly from the universe through your hands or is there like a, a intermediary battery in your, in your hara? Um, that I think is something that, that, that people might argue um, about. And I think that there is some evidence that in um, Reiki, early Reiki teaching, that there's it's important to like recharge your own battery. You know, some people say doing Reiki, you can never drain yourself, that you'll always have Reiki to give because it's not your personal energy. It's coming from the universe. But I think the idea that the more you practice Reiki, the more, you know, um, you're open to Reiki. The idea of, you know, in some lineages doing the meditation practice, um, which a lot of it 
is focused on the hara, right? The lower abdomen um, and bringing stuff in from the universe and strengthening your hara and then expanding it out um, through your body, connecting your hands to your hara. I mean, these are parts of the meditation practice um, or in the Takata lineages, right? The, the stress on every day, you have to treat yourself every day, right? Daily self-treatment. I think both of those in a sense are about recharging yourself and having yourself at your kind of peak level so that when you do practice um, Reiki, when you are treating others, that um, you're at your best, right? And that you're not, so I think it's a, kind of, a little bit of a controversial question and I don't wanna come down necessarily on one side or another, but I do think there's a lot of evidence um, in the tradition and in the history um, that it is important to recharge your own battery. I hope that uh, helps. <laughs> Octavio, does that answer your, your question? I mean, I know there's also the question about um, yeah. some people can really feel the difference of like different types of ki. And so, for example, like a, a qigong master, a qigong master, right, who cultivates ki, cultivates ki, and then releases it. And if you feel that versus feeling getting a Reiki treatment versus I, feeling getting a Joe Ray treatment, some people are very sensitive to that and can speak very well to that. I, I don't know that I can make a big generalization. Um, you know, I think that for me, if I have to, Reiki is very kind of gentle and warm and um, in general, but I've also had Reiki treatments that are very intense, like electricity. Um, so it's hard for me to make a big generalization. Uh, yes, I, I think my, um, for my own experience is about uh, for the intention the intention of key going is my intention for me or for the people. And Reiki is the universal. I, I only put my hands mm -hmm. and that's all. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is one of the difference between Qigong and uh, Reiki. Yeah, that's true. That with Qigong, your Kiko, Qigong, like, um, yeah, there is a lot of, um, intention moving right the will i guess is part of it where a lot of people in reiki world say you need to surrender right allow the reiki to move through you surrender don't try to use your intention just allow your hands to move right feel the, the energy feel the flow yes. yeah so yeah um justin i i would like to um ask you if you could elaborate a little bit about the word reiki because uh, in the um lineage from hawaii takata what we learned is that reiki two syllables ray universal energy and ki like the the vital the key yeah. energy of of each person yeah, but from your understanding in your research how how did um, Usui actually interpret that? Because Reiki is a word that existed way before uh, Usui, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, it's something I have in the longer version of the talk that um, I, I took out, um, but let's um, maybe I'll put up a slide again just so we can see the word. Uh, well, actually, is that a, the best one to see it on? Where, where's the best place to see it? Um, uh, do, 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 do. Oh, it's okay. Because I think maybe, that's one of I the hardest. Maybe I can just write it in the chat. I mean, so, so Re Reiki. Sorry, I just have to put it on Japanese. Um, so this is like the, the more modern way to write it um, is two characters. Um, the first one, day, um, like when it's by itself can literally be spirit, like ghost. Um, and actually because of that today in Japan, if you show someone those characters, 
a lot of times they think it's like a little scary or spooky because they think of a ghost and they think it looks like maybe like a cult of something like, uh, you know, with dead, dead spirits, there's a dead people's spirits or something. So um, a lot of times in Japan today, they don't write it like that and they write it um, like this, which is just like the syllables, eiki, um, and it's more like neutral. Um, but in Usui sensei, and then the second one, of course, is ki, right? So ki, you know, people translate often as like life force energy, um, although I would argue maybe it's not the best translation, it's fine. You know, it's for an everyday thinking about it. Sure, life force energy is fine. Um, but what is the day key? And that's a really hard question to answer because there's a lot of different things it could be. Um, one thing it could be is literally spirit key, right? That it's the key of the spirit as opposed to like a, a more coarse a more um body um like that it's it's the highest vibration or in a sense right that there is like um that qi or chi in chinese uh idea has it makes up everything in the universe so you know the um the energy but also the matter is key in chinese thought right so there is very very light very very subtle um, very, very like high energy forms of key, you might say. And then there's very, very coarse, heavy, um, turbid, I don't know, like heavy, uh, thick yeah. forms of key. And that's like matter. Like matter is key. That's why energy isn't always a good translation is because actually when you look at the, the old texts, matter and energy are both key, right? So... If that might be one way of thinking about the key is that it's the most subtle, the way that a spirit is to the body, maybe the key is to some other form of key. That's maybe one way to think about it. Um, another meaning though of day in Usui Sensei's time that was, that was maybe very common is this idea of like, it's like miraculous, it's wonderful. Right, like day as a prefix might not literally be spiritual, but it might be like merveilleux, you know, like a, like it's um or like um you know like for, like uh, yeah like like it's like merveilleux. It's like merve un merveille. Is that like a a, a marvel, right? In mm -hmm. English, it's like something amazing, like wonderful, mirac almost miraculous, right? And so, um, for example. In uh, where is it? here, uh, in the Gokai, um, this this term here, uh, reyaku, which is like one I translate it here as like wonder drug. Um, sometimes people translate it as like spiritual medicine, because you could see the day is the same as Reiki, right? It's, it's spirit, literally it's spirit, if you see it by itself. Um, but they also talk about like aspirin is a reyaku, right? And aspirin is not spiritual, right? No one is take, saying a little prayer before, well, maybe you do, I don't know, but like aspirin is, it's a, it's a medicine, it's a drug, you take it, but it's amazing. It's wonderful, right? When it was invented, people thought it was like a miracle drug. Right, and, and in some sense it is. Um, and so if aspirin is a reyaku, I don't think spiritual medicine is a good translation. Um, in English, we have this expression wonder drug. I don't, is there something similar in French or Spanish? Like, is there something like, is there another, like if you say like, like, a, um, like a kind of medicine that's like almost like a miracle medicine or something? I think so. Yeah. Panacea, panacea, panacea in English as well. Uh, oh yeah, panacea. Yeah. But so, um, but yeah, so I think that they, they yaku is a good example of seeing it doesn't always mean spiritual. It can mean like amazing, wonderful, um, miraculous, marvelous. Um, and so 
for me, and also I had a teacher in Japan, not a Reiki teacher, but like a, a historian teacher, and he believed this was the better translation, is that it's like a wonderful form of key, an amazing, magnificent, you know, miraculous form of key, something like that. That it, and so it's excellent key, maybe, or something like that. Um, but at the same time, there's other points where um, people clearly uh, recognize and acknowledge the kind of spiritual aspect. Um, like there's one article where that guy Matsui, who I talked about, um, he said, even though it's called Reiki Ryoho, I don't think it's Reiteki. I don't think it's spiritual because I'm not a good person. He's like, I'm not like a, a saint, but I can do this. And so you don't have to be spiritual in order to do Reiki. <laughs> and um, I thought that's kind of a funny line um, for a number of reasons. Um, but, but I think it does point out that people were aware, even in Usui's time, that it has a kind of like spiritual um, connotation. And I guess that's one thing about language, right? It's, it doesn't just mean one thing, that you can focus on different interpretations of that character um, in order to emphasize different aspects of Deiki. Mm. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Omar is asking, um, and maybe Omar, if you want to ask more details, but he's asking if you know the light, Lightarian or Lightarian Reiki. I don't know a lot. I don't know a lot. I know that it's like one of these, like I think from the 1990s forms that that with angels, but I don't really know a lot about it. But if you have a particular question about it, I'm happy to, to try to answer. Omar. Oh uh, first, first off, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's uh, oh, yeah. very, very interesting. Um, I was just uh, wondering about this uh, particular style of, uh, of Reiki, because uh, a friend of mine practices in uh, Montreal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering if you have uh, some information, because uh, it's the only person I know that practices uh, from my circle. And um, I was uh, a bit surprised to find out uh, on the website of this uh, school that they have lots of uh, levels. Like uh, she finished a master level uh, with uh, Usui's uh, uh, school, but then she just started. Like it's like a, an advanced form or an advanced view uh, of Reiki. Uh, but to me, well, uh, I, I didn't have any uh, reference to, yeah. to, to compare it or, or to see how how um, truthful to, to the original school it is. Sure. I was just wondering if you have any more information. Yeah, so thanks, thanks. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to hear about that. Um, so I got a few things I could say. So one thing is that, um, you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, um, you know, Reiki circle expanded, right? Many, many new students, many new masters. And of course, some of them have other practices they had before. And one thing that really became part, and I'm pretty sure, I don't know a lot about Lightarian, but I, I would, I believe from what I know of it was probably some overlap with like channeling, right? So people who receive new information from angels, from entities. Um, and so um, one common, I don't know that this is true with Lightarian, but one common um, aspect of those styles is that what Usui Sensei developed and, and taught in the 1920s was not the complete method and that there's more out there and that they received from God, from an angel, from an entity, new symbols, new teachings that they say is like the full system. And so because of that, the three or four levels that, that was often taught was not the full system, but there's more levels to go. Um, and that, that's something that many 
styles uh, developed in the 80s and 90s, that's a common attribute is that there might be seven levels or there might be, you know, then, and then in those seven levels, number six might be 6A, 6B, 6C, right? And so um, there's all these kind of new uh, opportunities for advancement. And I think on the one hand is a little bit understandable because I think a lot of people, once they become a Reiki master, feel a little anxious, like, am I, am I really a master? Is this real? Is that it? You know, and so to offer, I think, some opportunity for more advanced trainings, um, you know, even in, in some lineages where there is no further level, they may offer, you know, advanced workshops or something like that for, that are only for Reiki masters, right? And so having these, you know, further levels, I think the different lineages do it differently, but I think there is um, something to be said maybe for like advanced trainings, um, even when someone becomes an instructor himself. Thank you very much for your answer. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. But if anyone else knows more about Leiterian Reiki and wants to share, I'm, I'm interested to learn too. Are there any other questions or comments? Alguien quiere preguntar algo? I know I have a a question around the uh, the gokai, the precepts. Um, I I heard a conversation with Phyllis Leifurumoto, who was the uh, the granddaughter of um, Hawaii Otakata. For for those who are new to Reiki, and she was saying that Usui may have been actually inspired from the emperor Meiji and that, that he didn't actually conceive those presents himself, right. that he was inspired from the emperor to and adopted uh, among all the poetry, those phrases. Could you, could you speak a little bit about, about that? Yes, no, it's, it's a great question. And it's, it's funny you say that because I've actually talked, to, I actually talked to Phyllis about this very point. And um, so it comes, the, the reason why some people thought there could, that the Gokai could be from um, Meiji Emperor's uh, teachings is because, and I'm glad I actually have it right on my slide. I, ha I have this exact quote um, from Japanese. And so, um, when the um, memorial stone was discovered um, by Western Reiki practitioners in the 1990s, um, translating this text was like a major development, right? This was like the first time something outside of the oral tradition was really available about Usui Sensei. Um, and Phyllis, was taken here. She went to Japan, I believe in 1996, and met Japanese Reiki practitioners and was taken to the stone. And she had her own translation done of the stone. And this section, um, it could be a little bit ambiguous. And um, so I have my translation on the left there, um, and the Japanese text is on the right. And you can see, even in my translation, it's maybe a little ambiguous. It could, it could seem, you know, I say injunctions here. I mean, this could really be like instructions. It's a, a more normal word. <laughs> um, so like, you know, observe the instructions of the of Emperor Meiji and chant the five precepts. Was one of his instructions to chant the five precepts? You know, it's not really clear. Um, and, and in the Japanese, you have that same issue. Um, this, um, this character here, well, I can't highlight it, but 
um, the sheet um, in the middle there, again, it's like an ant. And it's not really clear entirely, were the five precepts a teaching of the, the emperor or not? Um, since that time, more historical work has been done and it's pretty clear that Usui Sensei did not borrow the five precepts from the emperor, but he borrowed them from another source. And I, I mentioned this to Phyllis and she said, you know what? This is why I should never talk about things I don't know that I didn't learn from my teacher because it leads to me saying things that aren't true and I'm never doing that again. And um, so yeah, she later in life, I think was like, okay, we were wrong about that. Um, and, and regretted ever saying something about that. Um, but yeah, it seems that um, Usui and his students both followed certain quote unquote teachings or instructions of the Meiji emperor, right? And chanted the five precepts, but those are actually two separate things. Um, I can talk more about the origins of the five precepts if you're interested. I do see there's another question in the chat about the martial yeah, arts. Yeah, so, exactly. And I know we are uh, oh, a little bit over the time. If oh, that's okay. okay with you. 90 minutes, I wasn't sure, okay. Yeah, do you have all, uh, two more minutes to answer the yeah, last Yeah, yeah, I, I thought actually it was two hours, so. Oh, I'm... okay. Um, so Omar is asking uh, that you mentioned the martial arts during your presentation. And he wonders if you can elaborate uh, the link or the connection between Reiki and martial arts. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, the first of all, you know, both Reiki and martial arts um, developed around the same time. I mean, there there are older martial arts traditions in Japan. The sword, you know, sword fighting, obviously, and things like that. Um, but uh, you know, the the martial arts that we think of today, karate. Judo, Aikido, um, were developed basically in Usui Sensei's lifetime, um, 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. Um, and I think early Reiki and martial arts um, have certain things in common that they also share with other types of, um, of traditional arts in Japan. So one thing is the concept of lineage, right? That your teacher um, and their teacher, their teacher, right? and you trace it back to a founder um, that you learn in a training center that Usui called his center a dojo, like martial artists did. Um, and that in the uh, Usui system, there were many ranks, right? Before you reached um, maybe even what we call second degree or mastered what we call first degree, that there were several ranks to go through and that, so you would go to meetings, your teacher would ask you to demonstrate something. They might correct you like, oh no, you don't put your, you know, they would feel the vibrations themselves and say, oh no, put your hand here. Like feel that, like the way that maybe a martial arts teacher would ask their students to go through kata, right? The different forms. Um, and uh, from my research, it indicates there were what, what we might think of as like practical examinations. Um, I've heard of a teacher um, in Japan putting key or reiki into one uh, diploma, one certificate, and then having them on a table with lots of certificates and having the student use their hand to find which one did they put the reiki in. And that was like a test to see before they're allowed to go to the next level, they have to be able to feel the reiki in one piece of paper out of many pieces of paper. And so um, those are a few things. And then also, I guess the, the advanced techniques, this is something not just in martial arts, but in many forms of traditional arts that advanced students learn advanced techniques and you're not supposed to share them with outsiders. You're not supposed to share them with students at a lower rank, right? These techniques are for people of a particular rank and they are not, other people are not ready for them. Um, it's not appropriate to share it with them. Um, so that's another thing that would, that would Reiki would share with, with other Japanese martial arts and things. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, you're welcome. And I think Ramon, I don't know if signed. Oh yeah, Ramon, thank you. Thank you for your 
kind words in the chat. Yeah. I was actually wondering if Ramon or Rossi would have any comment or any anything to share, any question. Hi, hello, Justin. Um, I'm certainly hoping that I can read your book very soon, very, very soon. That should be very interesting. Um, and I guess, I mean, there's just so much that I could probably ask, but that's okay. First, I'd love to read your book and then I probably have a thousand and one <laughs> questions. And I really appreciate, I mean, you've obviously, you've spent a lifetime on this. I mean, talking to all these people, it's brought back so many memories, you know, about my own work with students precisely. Um, and I think, you know, I, a lot of the information that you're saying is like, yes, I, I can, I can relate to that. So please let us know or let me know when, when your book's out, because I'm, I'll be the first one to say, I want a copy. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. Um, actually, I mean, so the book is an edited version of my of my of my PhD dissertation or thesis, which is available. If you scroll up at the top, I've got my website in the in the chat, and um, you can download it for free right now as a PDF from my website. Um, the book is a more revised version. It has some new information. It has some you know it was it went through like peer review uh, and scholarly publication. So other academics read it and they told me, okay, you have to change this, you have to put this in. So it's it's better. But if you want to read the, the beta version or something, um, the thesis is free to download online as a PDF. Um, so maybe if you want to do your first reading on that and then, and then check out the book when it comes out next year, uh, I'd be very happy if you want to email me any questions, comments, thoughts on the, um, the, the, the thesis. Thanks a lot. I, I definitely will go on your website and I'll download it and start looking it over. It's it's wonderful to see all this information. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, as you said, I put a lot of work into all of this. So to, to get you know appreciative audiences, it, it makes it feel worthwhile, you know. <laughs> Thanks. And I will make sure to share uh, Justin's website also on our community chat so everyone can have access. And I will share this recording with the community for those who couldn't attend. Um, I think the last thing would be just to share our uh, full gratitude for, for you, Justin, to really spend all the time, not only today with us, but all the hours that you have spent traveling and uh, researching, because this is what gives us uh, so much more clarity on what we are doing when we, when we say that we are practicing Reiki. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone. Muchísimas gracias a todas y a todos por haberse conectado. Merci beaucoup pour votre patience, pour votre présence ce soir. Y um, a las nuevas eh, chicas que están por, por ser iniciadas, estoy feliz de muy, muy, muy pronto. Eh, todo esto que acabamos de escuchar, vivirlo, sentirlo, porque ahí es donde está la esencia. And I guess we'll be in touch because I hope maybe this won't be the last time that we welcome you, Justin. Yeah, I hope I hope you know someday be in Montreal. I'm, I'm in Vancouver right now, on the you know the the land of the Coast Salish people. But I'd love to come out to uh, to Montreal sometime. I love Montreal and uh, be able to actually you know exchange Reiki and and I mean that that's that's a the dream. Yeah, be back in person. That would be amazing. So <laughs> we will set our intention for that. Okay. <laughs> Anything else that you want to say to wrap up the evening? Merci à tout le monde. And uh, yeah, muchas gracias. And... Moi, j'aimerais vous dire merci beaucoup. <laughs> Ça a été vraiment intéressant et très riche. Je ne parle pas anglais. Non, non, mais je comprends. Mais, oui, mais j'ai tout compris. <laughs> et je vous merci. remercie énormément 
pour tout l'apport que vous nous avez donné. J'espère qu'on continuera en communication. Mmh. À bientôt et merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Rosita. Merci, tout le monde. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Bonne soirée, tout le monde. Buenas noches. Bonne soirée. Thank you, bye. Bye, bye. Ciao. <laughs>